Global bond market strength, U.S. labor market weakness, and emerging market assets rattled by surprise election results. Live from Studio One here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Let's get you a check on where markets stand with one hour to go. You have the S&P 500, which was sitting on modest losses for most of the day, but has staged a bit of an afternoon rally, up almost eight points at the moment. Now, Treasuries have been gaining all day. That's pushing the yield on the 10-year down to 4.33%. That's a drop of five basis points. Uh, NYMEX crude extending recent losses. It's now at a four-month low for WTI, $73.40 a barrel following OPEC's unexpected decision earlier this week to loosen uh, its production quotas, allow more production in effect. And Bitcoin up 2.3% on the day, but worth noting that it got above $71,000 earlier today. It's up for a fourth straight day. Mike Novogratz telling Bloomberg, uh, Romain, that if Bitcoin regains the $73,000 level, he sees it going to at least $100,000 by the end of the year. All right, let's go back to the fourth line of your screen there, and that is the bond rally. A big focus today as it extends into a fourth day, pushing yield back down to levels from early April. We had a recent batch of economic data from last week into today that really has investors looking through signs that inflation is cooling and really focusing more right now on signs that economic activity itself is cooling as well. The so-called JOLTS data this morning showing job openings sliding to the lowest in three years, roughly 8 million jobs available in April. But that's down from 8.4 in March. That's pushing the ratio of job openings versus unemployed people to 1.24, and that is the lowest since 2021. The quits rate unchanged for a sixth straight month, and that suggests it's just not as easy to switch jobs anymore. Adding to the cross-asset anxiety today is the continued sell-off that we're seeing in emerging market assets. India equities posting their worst day going back to March 2020. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, his party, losing its majority in Congress and over in Mexico. The peso weakening the most in four years after Claudia Scheinbaum's landslide presidential victory, raising fears of less business-friendly policies. A lot of stories we have to get to today, Scarlett, but let's circle back to the big theme of the day, and that is all the activity in global bond markets. And when it comes to that activity, Romain, it's important to look at bonds in the context of other asset classes like stocks. Now, by one measure, equities are still a better bet. The S&P 500 has a Ford earnings yield premium of almost three-tenths of 1%, 2.691 to be exact. That is over the 10-year yield. So by this measure, stocks could be seen as undervalued because versus bonds, and this is all before the Fed even begins to cut rates. According to BlackRock's Wei Li, GDP may be cooling overall, but companies are proving that they're still able to keep growing. And you see that in their recent earnings and specifically in their expanding profit margins. All right, as we kick things off to the close, let's get it started here with Gene Tenuzzo, Columbia Threadneedles Global Head of Fixed Income, as we kick you off to the close here on this Tuesday afternoon. And Gene, a lot of talk right now about some of the moves that we've been seeing in the bond market. And I know there's really only been a few days of this here, but what is your general sense here about the direction that investors seem to be pushing yields right now? It has only been a few days, you're right, Romaine, but I think the, the bottom line is that bonds are back. And the reason is exactly what you were stating about what we're observing with the labor market. And you can look at the JOLTS data and see that job openings are down by about one third across the United States since the time that the Fed started raising rates. We already knew that the Fed's actions were having a material impact on more directly interest rate sensitive sectors like housing and certainly commercial real estate. Now we're seeing that impact broaden across the labor market. It doesn't mean that we're going to see non-farm payroll losses on Friday, but it does mean we should see continued deceleration, which should continue to take the steam out of inflation. So those are good news for, yeah. for bonds in the Treasury market. Well, for investors who are looking at their portfolios in a holistic manner, meaning looking at all the assets, and this gets to Scarlett's point in the chart that she showed here about that premium or rather lack of premium uh, that you're seeing versus equities. Is there a case to be made right now to not just have a higher allocation of fixed income in your portfolio, but to extend that duration as well? I think there is, you know, we would prefer sort of short to intermediate maturities, but I think it's time to start moving out of cash and adding that interest rate sensitivity to portfolios really as a diversifier, a diversifier to equities and a diversifier to riskier credit. I think it's important to note that really bonds relative to stocks are about as attractive as they've been in most of the last 20 years. And that's because real interest rates on government bonds are significantly higher. It's not because credit risk premia are that much higher. In fact, 
credit risk premium is pretty expensive if we start to look at the corporate bond market. So I think it's really one where an allocation to bonds makes sense. Longer bonds do make sense, especially as we think about a Fed that could be cutting rates soon. But it's not the time to be taking a ton of credit risk and high yield. You say an allocation to bonds makes sense, but that means convincing people to move out of cash. And I think that's a that's a high bar to clear. People are pretty accustomed and they like the income that that's generated by putting things in cash like instruments. Um, How much of a psychological hurdle is that? It's a huge psychological hurdle. Money markets are the big red easy button right now and investors are pushing it all day long. But I think reinvestment risk becomes more real when the propensity for the Fed to be lowering interest rates comes front and center. And I think we're only you know, months away from that at this point in time, that reinvestment risk is real. And when you start to see days like even yesterday where bonds are acting like that diversifier when stocks are down, I think investors become more comfortable that they want to move out a little longer and lock in that yield for a longer period of time rather than just overnight. Okay, you mentioned um, continued deceleration in job growth when we get the non-farm payrolls number on Friday. But right now we're looking at um, at least initially uh, the estimates are for an increase of 185,000 versus 175,000 in April. So it still looks like by some measures the labor market is very strong. How much do you trust the non-farm payrolls number, given that we know that there are some, you know, tweaks and and, um, you know, adjustments that need to be made because of migration patterns? I think non-farm payrolls are one piece of the labor market mosaic, but I would look at a few other things on Friday, including the unemployment rate, which has been trickling upward. And if it goes above 4%, I think that's the psychological level for investors. I'm also, of course, looking at average hourly earnings because that inflation data is in the mindset of the Fed and is going to drive their decision making. So non-farm payrolls are important. But what's more important is just the total picture of what the labor market is telling you, which is that we're no longer in a robust recovery mode, but we're really in sort of a slowing and decelerating economy that probably doesn't look that much different than the type of economy and potential growth that we saw pre-pandemic. All right, Gene, great stuff. Gene Chinuzo over at Columbia Threadneedle, helping us kick us off to the close as the bond rally continues for a fourth day. Coming up here on the big program, a closer look at assets over in India on the back foot after Prime Minister Modi losing a majority in Parliament. We're going to take a closer look at how the election results over there are rippling through emerging markets and around the globe. Coming up, we'll also get insight on where the biggest risks are in the commercial real estate market. Our guest, Ryan Williams, the CEO of Cadre. And with an equity market right now driven by technicals, who better to talk to than Ari Wald, head of technical analysis over at Oppenheimer. He'll be stopping by the program a little bit later. Stick around. A lot more coming up right here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. What is happening today is really, in the long run, really good for India because it forces India to choose a different course from the one it has been on, a course which has led to much wider unemployment and distress than needed in the country. Raghav Rajan, former Bank of India governor and now professor at the University of Chicago, giving us his take on India's election results. Now, the latest tally showing Prime Minister Modi's party losing its majority, but Modi is vowing to stay on as the nation's PM as part of a coalition government. This is the first time that he has been forced to rely on allies since storming to power a decade ago. India's markets plummeting on the news. Stocks are racing $386 billion in market value and the rupee weakening as well. Joining us now is Brendan McKenna. He is emerging markets economist and FX strategist over at Wells Fargo Securities. We're just saying that a lot of election results out of the emerging markets this week that have surprised investors, whether it's Mexico, whether it's India. um, And of course, we have the South Africa elections going on as well. Let's start with India, because this is the one that seemed to have caught people by surprise. What's your read on what's happening there? Yeah, I think it's absolutely a surprise. Um, I think kind of leading into the election, um, a Modi and a BJP and an NDA landslide was kind of the base case scenario, and markets had priced that in. Um, But now I think you're looking at a scenario where, yes, there's a little bit more political uncertainty, and the policy outlook is is a little bit more unpredictable in some ways. 
Um, so it kind of makes sense that Indian financial markets are kind of experiencing the volatility that they've been experiencing over the course of today. So uh, you could call this a knee-jerk reaction, but is this kind of a knee-jerk reaction to something that might end up being more balanced in the end, like Professor Raghun Rajan was hinting at? I think so. I think the knee-jerk reaction, again, is certainly understandable, but I do think it's going to be something that's going to be somewhat short-term in nature. It may not actually be a long-term, fundamental, structural type of political change that's going to uh, materialize in, in India. I do think you'll still see Modi um, in power, and I do think you'll still see the reform agenda continue to make progress. Um, but nevertheless, I do think that uh, some of the underlying, you know, call them vulnerabilities or structural weaknesses within India's economy may actually be on the way towards a little bit more balance if you can get um, kind of bipartisan types of support for some of these reform uh, type of items. I am curious uh, here, Brendan, I do want to broaden this out a little bit between sort of what you and your colleagues were talking about heading into the last week. You've basically had three really big elections in the emerging market space, South Africa, India and Mexico. Were you prepared? for the outcomes as they ended up being? I think we were a little bit more prepared for maybe Mexico, but mm -hmm. I think South Africa um, didn't take us as much by surprise, but India certainly took us by surprise. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, the base case scenario around India was really Modi, BJP, and a landslide, mm -hmm. uh, kind of maintaining the majority. Mexico, uh, Scheinmal was certainly kind of uh, the, uh, the leader kind of leading into the election, the supermajority. We were a little bit more prepared for it, but still a little bit of a surprise. We kind of knew that the ANC would lose its, its majority and there mm -hmm. would have to be a coalition there. I think kind of the bigger question around South, South Africa at this point is who is the coalition uh, eventually going to be comprised of. This does raise some broader questions here just about the EM trade overall. I feel like for the last year and a half there's been all this discussion that this is kind of the moment where we would see EM as a whole shine. Let's take China out of the equation because we know they have their own issues here. Is there still a fundamental case for being an EM broadly? I think so. I think so. Um, I think when you're thinking about where is growth actually going to come from this year, yes, part of it is, is, is China, but we could take that out. India is still on pace to grow 7, 7.5% 7 this year. And even though we have some political uncertainty, it doesn't look like the fundamental growth drivers in India are really going to be upended all that much. You're still going to get a pretty nice growth profile in India. And also some of the other countries in Southeast Asia, like Indonesia, uh, Thailand, there's a pretty strong growth profiles there too. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's still some, uh, some fundamental aspects that you can be optimistic and positive about in EM. I think the other thing is, you know, even though there's some political uncertainty, the strength of institutions over the, across the emerging markets over the last couple of years and decades have really improved. And I think that's something that gives a lot of confidence to investors when you're certainly considering some of these emerging market regions. When you're looking at the currencies of these EM regions, um, setting aside whatever the Fed decides to do with interest rate cuts or sitting pretty on what it has right now, what looks most attractive to you? I think carry looks very attractive. Um, we have a lot of these central banks, especially in Latin America, that they raised interest rates very aggressively and well ahead of the Fed. And now they're actually getting to the point where the easing cycles may be coming to an end. And that's right around the time where the Fed is at least considering cutting interest rates. And we can certainly debate the timing of Fed rate cuts, but at least from an interest rate differential perspective, those may actually start to be swinging back in favor of EM currencies. So over the medium to longer term, we might actually see a scenario where the most interesting carry uh, opportunities are still in emerging markets, and especially if the Fed is going to be cutting interest rates when a lot of these central banks are on hold. Um, again, interest rate differentials in the carry story are still uh, pretty attractive across the emerging markets. Is there one region or country that you would favor over another? I think we still like Latin America. Latin America, um, yeah. You know, even though we have the political uncertainty in Mexico, there's still a very nice carry opportunity available there. Ultimately, I do think the political noise will die down and some of the fundamental uh, factors that have made Mexico and the peso a really strong outperformer over the last couple of years will come back into focus, and mm -hmm. you'll see a lot more capital flows into, into Mexico. Yeah. Um, but we're also still optimistic on, on Brazil as well. The fiscal noise is a little bit concerning, but mm -hmm. again, I think we're at a point where the Brazilian central bank is probably ending its, its easing cycle. And again, interest rate differentials and carry opportunities are pretty widely available in Brazil at the moment. All right, Brendan, great stuff. Great to have you here on set. Brendan McKenna, Emerging Markets Economist and FX Strategist at Wells Fargo Security. A closer look here uh, at the market reaction uh, to uh, three uh, elections that we talk about this idea here. Uh, the RAN, the peso, mm -hmm. and of course what we saw with the rupee. I thought his comment, though, on Mexico was interesting, too, because that really was like the hot trade for a while. And I know it's only been two days of weakness here, so maybe that trade is yeah, still Yeah, borrow yen and buy the peso. But yeah, but I mean, maybe that can come back once uh, the initial knee-jerk reaction sort of settles down. Things will settle down right around the time the U.S. election heats up, and then it's anything goes. Yeah. So, because, I mean, you know, talk about ultimate election risk. That would be the big one. I, I was trying to avoid the elephant in the room, Scarlett. <laughs> Sorry, I had <laughs> to bring it up. We're supposed to look down on all the other countries and ignore our own uh, sort of foibles here. We can't. We uh, can't do that. Come on. <laughs> we cannot. All right.
hour. We are going to keep a focus here on the market. Some interesting news earlier today, uh, this involving Boston Beer shutting down reports of merger talks with a Canadian marijuana company. We're going to explain in just a second. That's coming up right here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side. Our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off today with Elf Beauty. TD Cowan lifting its price target to a street high, 235 bucks, up from about 190. The analyst over there, Oliver Chen, says the bullish target reflects significant white space in international markets that could be areas of growth for the beauty products retailer. Chen also praising management's execution and some exciting marketing campaigns. Nevertheless, the shares getting caught up in today's sell-off down about 2.5%. Next up, First Solar, Morgan Stanley, lifting its price target to the second highest on the street, 331 up from 248, with the analysts seeing upside for the solar equipment maker in rising power demand from AI. He also cites support from higher U.S. tariffs on foreign solar equipment. Nevertheless, those shares also on the back foot today by about 2%. And finally, GitLab. DA Davidson taking its $65 price target and cutting it to $50. That matches the current street lows out there, and the move comes after yesterday's earnings with analyst Gil Luria warning that it's taking GitLab too long to see revenue benefits from the adoption of its new AI features. GitLab shares down more than 4%, and those are some of our top calls. All right, we want to stay in the sell side space and turn to M&A and specifically rumors that are brewing about Boston beer in the limelight once again following a Wall Street Journal report that cannabis company Green Thumb Industries is interested in merging with the company. The story follows another report about deal rumors with the maker of Jim Beam, Suntory, also potentially interested. Now, Green Thumb declined to comment on the story. Suntory told Bloomberg it isn't in talks to buy Boston beer. And Boston beer said, just leave us alone. Gerald Pascarelli joining us right now, Senior Vice President of Equity Research over at Wedbush Securities. And Gerald, let's be clear here. I, all these rumors don't just pop up out of nowhere. Clearly something is going on. I don't need to know if the question is so much whether Boston Beer is interested in selling itself, but there does appear to be some degree of interest among other companies in combining with it. Do you see that? Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Um, absolutely. But it, it's important to note that Boston Beer has been a takeout candidate or, you know, it's been speculated that they are a takeout candidate for years. It's one of the reasons why if you look at the valuation on the stock, it will trade at a premium relative to all other beer companies because there is an inherent acquisition multiple um, or an acquisition premium embedded in the multiple. And so, you know, since I've been covering the space, we've heard, um, you know, speculation on on M&A with this company probably for a decade. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of the the interest now stems from the fact that shares are trading significantly below their historical one, three, five, and ten year averages. Um, and Jim Cook, who holds 100 percent voting rights of the company, um, is nearing retirement. And so I think that naturally you'll likely see these rumors continue to pop up. Whether or not um, you know one yeah. proves to be true is, is is hard to tell at this point. Yeah, and I'm glad you, you point out the retirement because that's certainly been a factor in some of the speculation. I, I do want to talk about just the underlying business here, Gerald, and the idea that sales growth at this company has been very erratic. I know they got a bit of a bump during the pandemic, but that was clearly a one-off here. Uh, I mean, just take M&A out of the equation right now. As a standalone company, what is the growth story right now uh, for Boston Beer and Sam Adams? Yeah. So over the, to your point, during the height of COVID, you, you really saw this boom in um, hard seltzer, and they were the number two market player in hard seltzer, where growth was in excess of 300% when everybody was home. That category rolled over. Um, craft beer as a category um, has remained stagnant. Cider's not really doing anything. And so when you look at the growth drivers for Boston Beer, um, Twisted Tea is their predominant growth driver. Twisted Tea has been a phenomenal brand for years. Um, they've been an organic, double-digit growth story um, you know, for well over a decade. And, you know, that is kind of keeping Boston beer afloat right now because um, it does have very good brand equity and it has very good consumer takeaway. So I think in terms of the outlook on where they go from here, I think everybody is looking to see when hard seltzer 
um, is going to trough, and specifically Truly's position within hard seltzer is going to improve. Uh, right now, it's if you look at the measured channel data, it's declining about 20% per month, and that's on comps of down 50% um, in the year ago period. So that category is under under pressure. So I think it's a com um, you know a combination of an improvement in, in Truly, and then um, you get sustained double digit growth mm. in Twisted T, and then I think you have a good top line algorithm there. Okay, got it. But I mean, bottom line, the stock has this m a premium that you mentioned um out of the different combinations that have been proposed what makes the most sense to you from where you sit yeah i mean it's it would seem like a a, a merger of, of of two companies just to create combined co would would seem reasonable i mean um it's it's just it's it's hard to imagine boston beer if they're a takeout candidate would want to acquire green thumb industries um for many reasons especially if you know, considering that that Jim Cook is nearing retirement, but also, you know, if they were to acquire Green Thumb Industries, it's unclear what would happen with their New York Stock Exchange listing. Because if they were um, selling cannabis products in the United States, they would be in violation of the Controlled Substances Act. Right. Um, Green Thumb Industries is about a two point five billion dollar market cap company that compares to three point five billion um, for Boston Beer. Um, they would have to raise a significant amount of debt to be able to to make this acquisition. And, and not only would that substantially increase their leverage, but <clears throat> cannabis in general uh, is capital constrained. And yeah. so, you know, their ability to raise that kind of capital just seems unreasonable. And so I think that what you would be looking at is ultimately, um, you know, a combination of, of, of both companies here. OK, got it. Um, in terms of, you know, timing, uh, we talked about Jim Koch's uh, impending retirement. Is that does that kind of create a natural deadline here for something to happen? I, I don't think so. Um, again, again, it's unclear what his um, what his his longer term planning is. And to be fair, he really has not, at least to my knowledge, given any indication that He's ready to retire. I mean, he is on the earnings calls. Um, if you if you hear him and listen to him on the earnings calls, he's very much still hands on with this business. He speaks with retailers. He speaks with distributors. He goes to trade shows. So this is you know this is a company that he built from scratch. Um, yeah. You know that that he cares deeply about, and that's that's the other thing to consider is that this is his life's work. Um, and you know, if it is now the time for him to look to sell when um, you know his top line growth is under pressure and right. the stock is nearing all time lows. Like, I, I don't know. Like, yeah. I, I, I just have a, a my my gut instinct would tell me that he would want to right. to see through, um, you know, for, for maybe a longer period of time. But Gerald, it's, it's difficult to tell. Appreciate your joining us and giving us your take here. Gerald Pascarelli over at Wedbush. Coming up, we'll take a look at risks in the commercial real estate market with Ryan Williams of Cadre. This is The Close. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Boston. And I'm Scarlett Fu. Um, it looked like we were just kind of going to have this day where bad economic news was actually bad for equities. It didn't turn out that way. Yeah, well, unless you're like a cyclical stock. I mean, the Russell's down like more than a percent. It's kind of that weird thing, right, where you're, we're getting relatively decent news on the inflation front. But that also is showing that what's driving down yeah. inflation is sort of a tamp down in economic activity. And I think everyone's worried is how much of a tamp down in that act economic activity are we going to get? Right. We wanted the slowdown yeah. inflation check, but uh, yeah. we weren't anticipating an overall broader slowdown yeah. economy that was keeping profits growing at these yep. uh, incredible speeds. Yeah. And of course, that's something that, uh, you know, investors now need to factor you, in. But you know what? I was going through mm -hmm. the, uh, all of the sectors today. You know what the number one sector is today in the S&P 500 in terms of gaining? It's Real estate. not tech. Real estate. Yeah. I don't um, know. Those dividend yields, Scratch your I guess. head. We, yeah. should, we both scratch our heads. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's, I don't want to scratch mine. You know, I'm worried about going the old school. <laughs> let's so, check with someone who can maybe provide some answers on that and uh, turn to the commercial real estate space. Because earlier today, we spoke with the Citizens Financial CEO, Bruce Van Son, and he says there is one specific area that he's watching. Uh, office is really the space that everybody's focused on. The rest of commercial real estate, the you shouldn't just generalize that all commercial real estate is an issue because multifamilies in reasonably good shape and industrial and warehouses in good shape, retails in pretty good shape. It's really just that office segment that folks are most focused on. 
It's always the office segment. For more insight, let's bring in Ryan Williams. He is founder and CEO of the commercial real estate investment management firm Cadre. Ryan, so good to speak with you. Um, you heard from Bruce Van Son. I wonder if you could just give us your point of view. How would you characterize the state of the commercial real estate market right now? There's a lot of negative sentiment around it and sometimes unjustly for certain parts of it. But would you say it's depressed? Yeah, great to speak with you. Good afternoon. And I, and I do generally agree uh, with Bruce. You can't overgeneralize real estate. It's unique in that um, there are almost micro strategies within the broader macro real estate investment ecosystem. Um, multifamily is a sector and a space that we love. Uh, you know, you're always going to need somewhere to live. We have a chronic housing shortage across the country um, and housing prices aren't going down. Um, life sciences office is another sector that's impacted by, you know, the funding, the venture world, and that's had its ups and downs. Um, big city office obviously is, is one of the most challenged sectors, but I've been encouraged to see um, really a, a proliferation of private public partnerships. You read about what's going on now in downtown Chicago, um, with the city uh, really helping with conversions. And so I think overall what I would say is um, you have to be uh, hyper-local and hyper-targeted when, when characterizing the real estate space. Um, and we are in unique times. We're in times where, you know, despite uh, real estate values uh, generally depreciating, the equities market's going up, um, the broader market seems to be performing well. Um, and so what I think that points to more than anything else is that you've got to stay sector focused mm -hmm. um, and you can't be a broad thematic investor. OK, so if you say sector focus within uh, commercial real estate with the Federal Reserve, um, perhaps moving to cut interest rates later this year, which which sector within commercial real estate will that benefit first? Well, I think the first sector it benefits uh, is the sector that's most challenged right now, uh, which is office. Um, you know, right now, there's just not a lot of transactions happening um, in the office space because uh, you can't get financing new financing, refinancing. Um, banks in many ways have been um, almost paralyzed. Some of it's out of uncertainty, some of it's out of, you know, trying to manage through their own portfolios. And so um, I expect to see more office transactions happening at somewhat elevated pricing levels. Um, and I expect there to be a lot of, frankly, compelling uh, deals that arise as well. So I think office will be the first sector and probably the most significantly impacted sector because it's it has the, the furthest to grow in terms of the baseline values today. Um, but the, the key ultimately um, to there being transaction activity is price discovery. The key to price discovery is financing clarity um, and financing opportunity. And I think that's what you'll see uh, cascade once the Fed does um, make a decision on rates. If the Fed does make that decision on rates or at least communicates it, Ryan, and we talk about this idea of clarity, does that actually provide enough transparency? Does that clear enough smoke out of the way? Because at the same time, you're still talking about other structural issues in this market, such as work from home and other things that are impacting this that go beyond just interest rates. I think I think it's step one. It's a great it's a great question. You know, I, I do think that uh, it will provide enough clarity for those who are, um, you know, really kicking the can on, um, you know, looking at refinancing or selling yeah. uh, to uh, dip their toes in the market. It, it gives enough clarity for um, many of the, the, the stressed owners of real estate to say, you know what, um, you know, I now have an option beyond giving back the keys to this office building. Um, and that could be, you know, selling at a massive discount um, to the intrinsic value. Um, or that could be refinancing. You know, one of the, the themes that you hear, or you used to hear, I should say, uh, was survive through 25. Um, now we're hearing persist until 26. Okay. And wow. I think that in many ways is, is the theme yeah. Yeah. Um, of office owners uh, in this environment that, you know, interest rate cuts yeah. uh, will uh, will bring to, to top of mind for everyone. Well, I hope we get to 2026 because I'm not sure much rhymes with uh, 2027, Ryan. <laughs> I, I am curious, though, specifically about the folks uh, on the Cadre platform, the folks that are using your products here. Have you noticed any sort of change in what specifically they're looking at, what specifically they're putting their money into? Has that changed materially over the last, I don't know, year? Yes, great question. We have noticed, and, and we... Uh, do our best to be responsive to our, our clients' um, portfolio needs. Um, we have noticed a couple of interesting themes 
um, and trends. I'd say the first theme is that um, there are a lot of investors on our platform that uh, are looking for a way to diversify outside of equities and crypto. And so many of those investors are looking for a way to diversify, but also to get a deal because they read about you know, the discounts that are likely to happen uh, when the Fed uh, reduces rates. And so we've seen on our secondary marketplace, a proprietary exchange platform that we've developed um, an increase in appetite and an increase in activity amongst secondary buyers. So those investors that are willing to bid on other interests or stakes on our platform and existing assets. So we mm. see uh, secondary market activity increasing, which is a theme that I, I believe you'll see uh, more broadly in, in the near term, given the number of uh, funds that have redemption requests, um, you know, whether it's the, the non-traded REITs or otherwise. Um, and, uh, and then the other theme we've seen is a focus on, on yield. Yeah. Um, you know, this environment is one in which uh, you can get a risk-free yield in the mid-single digits. Um, and so investors have kind of increased the bar for what they're looking for as it relates to, to cash flow and yield. So, you know, where it used to be a 5 6 7% cash flow yield mm -hmm. opportunity would, would, would uh, um, you know, sell out in minutes or hours. Now, you know, that bar has been increased to 8 9 10% uh, in terms of the appetite. And so I think that's one theme uh, in addition to the increase in liquidity um, activity and interest that we're seeing um, on a daily basis. All right, got to leave it there, Ryan. Really appreciate you taking time for us. Ryan Williams there. He is the founder and CEO uh, of the commercial real estate platform, Acadre. And I didn't get a chance to ask him this, but there was a great uh, report that came out by this economist over at New York University right at the end of last month mm -hmm. that talked about the exposure that banks have to commercial real estate and saying that when you factor in REITs, mm. it's a lot higher than what we think it is because we only kind of measure it based on their direct investments. Mm. And we kind of forget there's all these indirect investments out there that's creating a lot of exposure. And I guess, think that gets to his first point that banks still don't have a lot of clarity right now as to what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, um, if you don't have to mark anything, you're not necessarily going to either. You had mentioned that REITs are the best performing sector of the yes. day. Also for the past five days, up 3.3%. But uh, over the past three months, uh, REITs no, have no, <laughs> are no, the worst here. performing <laughs> down 4.3%. All right. Well, uh, we're going to get back uh, in just a second here, talk about some of the big movers on the day. GameStop. I thought it was going to be up again, but apparently uh, the bloom coming off the rose here. The share is doing a reverse, Uno. That's Thank like you. barely a move for GameStop. I just want to say, whoever wrote reverse Uno into the prompter, chef's kiss there. <laughs> a 21% rally on Monday. It's our stock of the hour. It's coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for our stock of the hour, a closer look at shares of GameStop. At one point, they jumped about 47% over the last few days after trader Keith Gill uh, posted what appeared to be a $116 million position in the stock. The rally, though, fizzling just a little bit today. The shares down about 3%. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now. Talk a little bit more about our stock of the hour. And I was just kind of going through the whole ructions in this stock. I mean, this was basically like $17 stock at the end of April. Then sort of picked up momentum in May. Roaring Kitty had the post on X. That sent the stock up to like 50 bucks. It sold off. Then he posted this cryptic thing on Reddit the other day. He had the big rally there, and now it's pulling back again. What's going on? It's pretty amazing, yeah. this volatility. I mean, it's hard to know where to start. Now, net-net within there is a 550% rally, you know, basically over the time period of a few days because of his yeah. uh, memes, you know, indicating that he's going to get involved. So, you know, that stands out, obviously. The $116 million unverified retail position stands out. I mean, one could assume that all the money that he made back in 2021, he's poured into this. But, you know, the other thought that crosses your mind, is this him alone? But then, you know, there's something else. That's, that's $160 million position. <laughs> What's that? And he still had the calls on top and of it. And the calls right. on top of it. Which yeah, like, I mean, it's a that's lot, a lot of money. It's a lot of money yeah. for some guy, some dude in Massachusetts <laughs> out of his basement. To be and crazy. I assume he's not in the basement anymore. Uh, yeah, he's yeah. probably now up yeah. in the penthouse somewhere. Right, yeah. um, but then there's also this moral sense that something is not quite right here. Back in 2021, it was us versus them, retail yeah. versus institutional. Whereas now, you know, the fact that he has the long position 
position in the stocks and the options. It's like, what's going on? Because if he's trading listed, everybody sees it. If he's trading OTC, you don't see it. So he's saying that he still has these positions. But if he's going OTC on well, one side, yeah. then, you know, we're not seeing well, that's it. Well, that's the other thing. Sorry to, uh, to co-op this, but, uh, like, it's not showing up in the numbers. I mean, it's possible he could amass this position very slowly, and that's why we're not seeing it. But everybody's going through the trade records, and you're just not seeing those big sort of entry points. Well, it's, so he could be OTC, which is yeah. very, you know, sophisticated. But nobody would know. It takes a lot more time. Yeah. Something that stands out to me, yesterday you actually broke the news, E-Trade, uh, Morgan yeah, Stanley yeah. reporting mm -hmm. that E-Trade is, or that Morgan Stanley yeah. and E-Trade are thinking about reviewing his account. Yeah. They would know, because they if know. his positions are listed, they yeah. would see at least one side or both sides. I'm not saying that they're not seeing both sides, but they actually know what's going on there. The fact that they wanted to have a conversation. So, yeah, there's a lot going on here. And I think that that's back in 2021. It was fun. It was like, go Roaring Kitty, go Meme Stocks, AMC. Plus, there was the nostalgia around it. Whereas this time, it's like, all right, so this guy posts these memes, one of them being an Uno card, and all of a sudden, his position is up so much. The SEC pro is probing, too. Yeah, like you said, back then, it was sticking it to the man. Now he's the man. He is so the man. So who's he sticking it to? <laughs> all right. Abigail Doolittle, thanks so much. Uh, focusing on GameStop, our stock of the hour, stock of the day, stock of the past week, really? When, when do I get stock to be a man? Well, I'm sorry? <laughs> when do I get to be a man? <laughs> you are the man. <laughs> no, Coming up, we've got Ari Wald <laughs> of Oppenheimer joining us Stick for the close. <laughs>
As far as the tactical opportunity, I don't think we're there just yet. You know, it's, it's more than just the level. It's how you get to the level and the behavior around the level. So first off, where, where are we coming from and where are we going? Uh, first off, and, and let's think in terms of and talk, talk about it through the VIX. The VIX is coming off a level of 11 and a half. It's the lowest level since November 2019. To us, that is a type of condition you'll see in a bull market. The VIX is, provides these asymmetric signals. You can't necessarily sell stocks because the VIX is low, because a low VIX is a function of a bull market. But as far as the tactical opportunity, you want to buy it when the VIX spikes. And we're not quite there. I think in this environment, uh, a 50 percent spike from its recent low would be that opportunity that could get you. Uh, that would be equivalent to a VIX around 18. And I think that would be the type of opportunity traders should be looking for over the coming weeks, especially as we enter this strong seasonal backdrop in an election year, June to August, actually the, the three uh, strongest months of the year with an incoming candidate. So the setup is there. Uh, you want to buy weakness, but I think probably there's a, we're, we're not quite there as far as forming that near term low. Okay. So we need to see a decline and then a spike in the VIX before it's kind of um, the systems indicate it's time to go in. You also say that momentum as a factor should continue to be rewarded. We were just talking with Abigail Doolittle, who I know you know well, um, about GameStop. What do you mean by the momentum factor? Is that meme stocks or is that something else? Uh, that is something else. Me, uh, the meme stocks are more of a casino trade for us. Uh, we are momentum investors that overlay technical analysis on top of our process. Uh, momentum investing being the phenomenon and the market anomaly where stocks that have outperformed over a prior 12-month period are often stocks that typically outperform looking ahead. So it's not just stocks that rise a lot in a short two-week period. It's kind of your established leadership over the prior year. And what we found is in thinking in terms of this bull market cycle, we've looked at how the factor has performed around those cycles is that once the leadership of the bull cycle is established, mm -hmm. uh, the momentum factor typically really starts to accelerate in the second year of a bull market. Uh, that the leader, which is to say that the leadership stays and continues to drive gains looking ahead. So um, hot rating high in our work is going to be sectors like industrials, financials and technology specifically in dust, uh, infrastructure, capital markets, and semiconductors, uh, those would be some of our favorite areas. That would be momentum, how we define it. Got it, got it. Um, I also want to ask about perhaps stocks with momentum to the downside, at least in the short term. We look at oil prices. They're now down for a fifth day, and energy stocks are becoming a regular drag here. From a technical point of view, how important is oil's price action to the trend lines that you see in equities? Sure. Well, speaking for the equity market as a whole, we've seen the correlations change in 2023 down, you know, falling oil was a support for equity prices and coincided with some pretty strong rallies. We're seeing opposite action as it stands today with falling oil prices uh, coinciding with this kind of heavy market action. Uh, I, I think looking ahead, oil prices should remain range bound. I think generally speaking, the dollar is going to be range bound and that's going to support more stable uh, commodity prices looking ahead. For that reason, uh, energy is a market weight sector. I think you could be selective within there. Oil refiners look best. Select EMP names, less so the service names. What really rates uh, in terms of low momentum for us is actually more uh, low volatility, high dividend paying, uh, counter cyclical defensive sectors like consumer staples, <laughs> utilities, and REITs. Uh, those would be the sectors we're uh, most worried about. Just, right. just simply because we think they could underperform in a rising market tape. All right, Ari, going to have to leave it there. Great stuff. Ari Waldo there, head of technical analysis over at Oppenheimer, helping us count you down to those closing bells. Those bells just about three minutes away here with stocks remaining here uh, on the back foot uh, here on the day. So we should point out the S&P holding on to modest gains of about a tenth of a percent here. Carnival, Norwegian and Royal Caribbean. Those are your three biggest percent gainers right now in that. Uh, and they did very well because of this insatiable demand for cruise lines yeah. or cruise trips overall. Yeah. Remarkable. Um, I don't know who these people are. Like Your every now and then, my grandparents. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, I got an aunt who pretty much lives on a cruise ship. She just there you know, go. She gets off one, and two weeks later, she's on another. She doesn't even need a house. <laughs> I think that's their, like, their favorite customer, who they're going after. It's so interesting that uh, the S&P 500, not near any trend lines, but the 10-year yield is. All right, we are moving closer to those closing bells. Sit tight. Full market coverage coming up right here as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now.
And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast. We're joined right now by Tim Stenovic, Emily Grafeo in today for vacationing. Carol Masser, welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, and our partnership with YouTube, Tim. Stocks still kind of a mixed bag as they have been since hitting those record highs just about two weeks ago. Yeah, the S&P 500 kind of searching for direction today. Um, we did see some kind of clear moves early in the session, but it moved between gains and losses about a dozen times so far today, Emily Grafeo. So up about one-tenth of one percent right now, but no clear movement. Yeah, and Tim, we were just talking about earlier how stocks didn't really move that much on that jobs report or the jolts report, but the bond market really seemed to like it, but stocks really shrugging it off, Scarlett. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that um, bad economic news was seen as bad news for the stock market. Um, and that's is definitely a change from, say, two weeks ago when the S&P 500 is at its record high and everyone was saying, oh, the bad news is great. It means the Fed's going to move soon. Yeah, absolutely. Here, and it gets to the question is, when do we get that clarity? We were speaking with the Ryan Williams, uh, the founder of Cadre, about commercial real estate. And he really talked about this idea, at least from a real estate perspective, that's really what the investors there are looking for, is for the Fed to pro finally provide some clarity. And maybe that's also what investors in other asset classes are looking for as well. Do you think we'll see that clarity next no. Wednesday? <laughs> no, not at all. No? You don't? No. The countdown is on. No, and here's the thing. It's not the Fed's fault because the right. Fed, I think Jay Powell will be as clear as he can be. But the market will, of course, interpret it in some janky way, and then we'll just sort of rinse and repeat for the next few months. <laughs> is that a technical term? I, I'm trademarked. Okay. Uh, we get the closing bells here in New York. This is where people clap and cheer for a job well done. Uh, a mixed bag, though, in the markets here on the day. You do have some green across the screen with the Dow Jones Industrial Average going to finish the day higher by roughly 140 points or about four-tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 up about eight points or one-tenth of a percent. The NASDAQ composite is higher by 28 points or two-tenths of a percent. But here are your decliners on the day. You can find that in the cyclical and small cap space. Dow Transport's down nine-tenths of a percent. S&P 400 mid-cap's down 1.3, and the Russell 2000 guys down 1.3% on yeah, the day. Yeah, that Russell 2000 really taking out on the chin today. Much bigger movement than we saw in the S&P, the NASDAQ, and the Dow. Speaking of the S&P, uh, Kind of an even split between gainers and decliners in the S&P 500, Scarlett. 230 did move higher, 273 stocks moved lower. And that's pretty much reflected in the sector performances as well. Let's take a look at the IMAP, which shows you how the different sectors performed. And the reason why there's so much more green on that screen is because tech finished up four tenths of 1% for the third best performance. Real estate investment trusts and staples were the best performers. And yeah, give us some love, Scarlett. Right, well, as it's you sexy. mentioned, Romaine, REITs uh, were the best performers <laughs> over the past five days as well. Your weaknesses, your weak spots are materials, energy, and financials with materials down about 1.2%. Okay, I got the gainers today because Carol's out, so I get to do the stocks that moved higher. Wow. I do want to start with Telorian. Do you sit in her chair, too, when she's gone? Uh, no, 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 no. Emily gets that today. Uh, Telorian shares uh, finishing the day higher by 17%. This after Bloomberg reported earlier that the company is in discussion with Saudi Aramco and Woodside Energy Group to invest in its liquefied natural gas export project in Louisiana. Telorian has reviewed, uh, reviewed various equity investment offerings from the energy companies related to its plant, said the people who asked not to be named as they are not authorized to speak to the media. Shares higher today by 17.1%. And shares of cruise operators surged today. I want to pick one out specifically. Carnival Corporation shares moved higher today by more than 5%. We did get some news late yesterday that the company is going to sunset p and Cruises Australia and fold Australia operations into its Carnival Cruise Line operations. So Melius Research came out with a note today that said that Carnival's decision to consolidate its p and Cruises Australia brand is, quote, hugely symbolic of the change underway from CEO Josh Weinstein. Um, Cunningham over at Melius Research also says that this could be the catalyst to start a rally. You also had Peel Hunt uh, upgrade its recommendation to buy, noting that the company will appeal to more investors as it accelerates its debt for equity swap. And then a little M&A news uh, coming at you for my final gainer today. Core Scientific, ticker C-O-R-Z, just surging today, finishing higher by more than 40%. The, this after the 
uh, company, uh, well, I should say Bloomberg reported that CoreWeave has offered to acquire uh, Core Scientific, the Bitcoin mining company, for about a billion dollars, just according to a person with knowledge of the matter. Uh, CoreWeave's all cash bid yeah. of $5.75 was made on Monday and comes as the company seeks to expand its AI data center capacity, this according so to Core a person. CoreWeave and Core Scientific, what's I know. the name going to be when they combine? The Cores. Oh. Yeah, they got to go. Double Core. Yeah, that one I had to read very closely to make sure I got the Cores correctly. Yeah, and I'm but, still not sure you did, but we'll go with it. All right. Wasn't core, there a band called the Core? Potentially buying Core. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the decliners you, in for uh, in for Carol today. I'm looking at Freeport MacMoran. That was down as much as 6% falling alongside the broader materials and energy stocks amid a drop in global commodity prices today. We saw copper falling below 10,000 as inventories are rising. Earlier, Bloomberg had reported that stockpiles on the Shanghai Futures Exchange climbed to the highest level since 2020. But of course, we also saw copper top a record high just a few weeks ago at around 11,000. So 10,000 here, not uh, not too bad for copper, but dragging down Freeport McMoran today, a mining company. I'm also looking at two retailers, uh, DBI. This is the owner of Designer Brands, Designer Shoe Warehouse. Romaine, I yeah. know you love that store. Mm, I went in there once and it scared me. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of shoes in there. A lot. And they're just like <laughs> spread out on the floor. What's, what's that? They're all over the place. You Easy have to hunt. Access. You have to hunt and peck. Anyway, this stock was down as much as 22%, biggest drop since March, and the earnings were all around bad. It was a miss on um, adjusted EPS and comp sales, the latter being down 2.5% versus analysts estimating a gain of about 0.6%. The CEO, Doug Ho, did say, we believe that we're on solid footing as we enter the summer months and are pleased to reaffirm our guidance for 2024, but that was not enough to lift the stock again down as much as 22% and about 20% at the close. And lastly, one more retailer, Bath & Body Works, saw its biggest drop since April 2020 after another earnings miss. Net sales were down 2%, and it sees um, net sales down 2% to flat in the second quarter. Yeah. Analysts saying that this is going to likely lead to a worsening in sales growth and earnings. Growth. All right, well, we still have earnings, uh, believe it or not, here. CrowdStrike crossing the wire. So, too, is HPE, HP Enterprise here. There are two Q numbers. This is the fiscal quarter here. Revenue coming in. Looks like a big beat, $7.2 million. The street was looking for 6.8. Adjusted EPS beat as well, $0.42 cents, uh, versus uh, what the street was looking for at about $0.39 a, cents a share here. The company's guidance for the fiscal third quarter, it sees net revenue at $7.4 to $7.8 billion. The low end of that range is right around the average of analyst estimates. EPS, their guidance for the third quarter, 43 cents to 48 cents a street on average was looking for 46 cents a share. And the company guy is saying that they still see their full year uh, free cash flow mm. at least $1.9 billion. The street looking for roughly about $2 billion. Okay, so shares of Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, up about 8%. We're seeing... Uh, a different move, the complete opposite, coming from CrowdStrike. Uh, the company did report first quarter revenue that beat estimates, but shares down 7.4% right now. For uh, fiscal year revenue coming in uh, between $3.98 billion to $4.01 billion, that's above estimates. Uh, second quarter revenue uh, coming in, uh, or estimate coming in at $958.3 million to $961.2 million. Estimates were for $954.6 million. Again, first quarter revenue beat estimates, um, but the company is down by about 6% in the after hours. Yeah, I'm looking at CrowdStrike. Uh, part of it is because people were expecting the company to have a beat and raise quarter. And the big question here is its annual recurring revenue and how that plays out. Um, going back to Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, for a moment here, I just looked at the company statement uh, from Antonio Neri, the president and CEO. He has two paragraphs and he mentions the words or the uh, acronym AI, one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven, eight times. That's it? <laughs> yeah, that's quite a bit. But um, the, the, the headline here for them is that AI systems revenue more than doubled from the prior quarter. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, obviously this is where they see the growth coming from. Well, this is curious, too, because, I mean, we talk a lot here about how some of the companies that are supposed to be benefiting from AI haven't necessarily shown that in earnings. We saw that, of course, with Dell. Uh, we saw that with some of the software companies last week here. So at least in this one particular earnings report out of HP, I guess you could maybe take some encouragement here, at least if you believe this is coming from AI, uh, that at least there's a benefit flowing immediately to investors. Yeah, they get about 100 basis points of a gain in the post market for each time they mention AI, Romain. That's a, okay, you should use that in your story, Emily. <laughs>
That's it's hey, my drafts. I do. I do want to just go back to CrowdStrike because it is a lower right now. Uh, the company's uh, president, CEO, and co-founder George Kurtz coming out and saying uh, that the uh, differentiated architecture has a wide competitive moat and uniquely enables CrowdStrike to solve the industry's biggest cybersecurity, IT, and data problems. Still, not a beat in raise though, as Scarlett mentioned. Um, investors were expecting. Guys, that is going to do it for our cross-platform coverage. We call it Beyond the Bell here on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Originals, and pretty much every where you can get us, including YouTube as well. We'll be back, though, tomorrow, same time, same place. We'll see you then. All right, stick with us. Our coverage continues here on Bloomberg Television. Coming up, a conversation on cybersecurity with Jeff Shiner, the CEO of 1Password. That's coming up in a bit, right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bosick. As we take a look at where the markets closed out the day here on this Tuesday afternoon, you did have some green on the screen, but that was primarily confined to some of the big cap names. The S&P 500 eking out a gain of about a tenth of a percent, though that was really on the back of a rally that we saw in consumer staples and in real estate. Meanwhile, the bond market continued to show it is still important. A four-day rally now pushing yields down once again on the benchmark by about five to six basis points here as we move closer, closer to what could be an inflection in some of the macro data. Of course, a big jobs report this Friday and a big Fed meeting, Scarlett next Wednesday. All right, let's look at some of the day's big movers here. We'll start with Beth, Bath and Body Works, losing almost 13% on the day. Its first quarter results did beat, but its second quarter guidance left something to be desired, with sales being flat or down and its EPS missing the consensus. Coinbase, one of many crypto names that did rally today, up 5.5%. Uh, Bitcoin's climb above $71,000, lifting the sector overall, but also Bitcoin money company Core Scientific being acquired by a cloud computer company for about a billion dollars as well. And Spotify, I just wanted to mention very quickly here at a fresh three-year high, extending yesterday's gains on its plan to hike prices for a second time in 12 months. And <clears throat> Spotify is not the only one exercising pricing power. Warner Brothers Discovery is hiking monthly rates for its max streaming service no. just in time. Yeah, that's right, for the second season premiere of House of the Dragon. Now, the cost for ad-free max subscriptions goes up by $1, which sounds more palatable than the percentage increase, up 6.25% for the basic package and up 5% for the premium package. And, of course, this is all part of the media industry's effort to now focus on profitability rather than subscriber growth. Hmm. Not sure I like the sound of that, Scarlett. Uh, all right, let's get back, of course, uh, to some of the breaking news that we just got, including earnings out of CrowdStrike here. The company forecasting revenue for the second quarter that, at least on the surface, seems to beat the average of analyst estimates, but the stock remains on the back foot here in after hours trading. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence joining us right now to break down, I guess, what we learned here. The numbers on the surface were pretty good, both in the existing quarter and their guidance here. But once again, and it seems to be the narrative this earnings season, it appears that investors wanted to see more. I mean, in this case, yeah. you know, this is a company that's trading at 20 times EV2 sales. So clearly uh, a lot higher expectations going into the print and the buy side numbers were higher. But like you said, there isn't anything that stands out in terms of a negative. It's more the new ARR growth was 22 percent. Last quarter it was 27 percent. So a sequential decline. But when you look at the endpoint security space, it's consolidating. Yeah. And right now you've got Microsoft, Palo Alto Networks, CrowdStrike, and Sentinel One, which is a small player. So, I mean, last year it was 15 companies. Now we are talking about four, and CrowdStrike really stands out in terms of the consolidator. They have done a lot of acquisitions, and to my mind, you know, if they are light in terms of their guide for next quarter, yeah. it doesn't hurt them much. I mean, these sort of uh, valuations go up and down in terms of multiple, so not not anything to complain yeah. about here. And really. you're actually talking the stock up now. That valuation actually went back <laughs> into the green as you were speaking, sort of yeah. oscillating there. So yeah. you mentioned how CrowdStrike is right in the middle of this consolidation story. At what point do regulators get involved because there's a little too much consolidation and not enough competition? I mean, the good thing with cybersecurity is you don't have large companies like you have you know, on the software side with Microsoft and SAP and all those guys. CrowdStrike's annual revenue is a $4 billion run rate. 
The largest cybersecurity company, Palo Alto, is close to a $10 billion run rate. So even if there is consolidation, they could compare themselves to a Microsoft, mm. you know, with $300 billion in revenue. So clearly, from that perspective, there isn't a lot to complain about from a regulator's standpoint. But Microsoft can't go out and buy anyone, can they? Or they could? I think <laughs> it'll be very hard if Microsoft were to buy Sentinel One or one of the smaller players. They probably could make a case because the rest of their business is diversified. Mm. But I think it'll come under scrutiny because it could affect the other guys like CrowdStrike. Are you saying, Scarlett, that Microsoft's under a little scrutiny I'm, right I'm now? I'm not saying anything. Um, <laughs> it gets to a broader question, too, just about, because we talk so much now about cybersecurity, even more so than we used to, primarily because of the advent of AI and all the things that get baked into that here. And I know there's a lot of, you know, a lot of hype in, baked into this, but are we going to see a more robust cybersecurity industry as a result of this push into AI, and more importantly, the consumer side of AI? Absolutely. I mean, when you think about, you know, how the cybersecurity software works, it is a lot of analytics. It is a lot of finding that needle in the haystack to figure out whether it's a breach or not. And that's where, you know, if you have a powerful summary feature or a co-pilot that can really help you summarize all the alerts that, you know, you're looking at as potential vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. it could be huge. But we haven't seen these companies call out Copilot revenue yet. Microsoft is the only one that keeps touting Copilots. Yeah. But you want to see a pure play name like uh, CrowdStrike, uh, you know, talk about their Copilots. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, man, and I got some thoughts on Copilot, but we'll talk about that <laughs> once we get off air. Mandeep Singh over at Bloomberg Intelligence. A closer look there at CrowdStrike, those shares of Scarlet kind of oscillating uh, between gains and losses here in after hour trading. But it gets to a broader question, too, about the refocus on cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole nature of AI is that it kind of has to be open, right? The idea is you're pulling in data from all these different places, and that creates a certain security risk, right? Absolutely. I mean, I just think about any time I have to go online to do anything and how difficult it is to first come up with a username and then a password that I can actually <laughs> remember aside from using the same password for every single so you, so account. it's not foo and then your birthday is that uh, uh, oh sorry okay ax that <laughs> all right we do want to continue the conversation here because this is an important matter and one that investors have really focused in on now one password it's a private company but it's valued at about 6.8 billion dollars its last series c fundraising included big names scarlett johansson justin timberlake even for pharrell and they're potentially seeking to go public this year. Our next guest knows a lot about what's going on in the world of security. He's a CEO of 1Password, Jeff Shiner, joining us here in Studio One. Jeff, great to see you. Great to see you, and thank you for having me here. I, I want to talk about kind of specifically how your product folds into the AI space, particularly on the corporate side. Because when we talk to so many folks about AI, and I'm talking about the CEOs and the other executives, they say that one of their biggest concerns is in order to make these AI programs work in the way they need it to work, they need to keep that door open. They need to allow people into that ecosystem. But they're concerned about who those people are and making sure they can be verified. How does one password, if at all, fit into that ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. If we look at what AI does, it's AI does content very well with context. And if you look at what a, a big challenge is for humans, for employees at a business, it is everything from phishing to, you know, as you were, you were joking about passwords and are you using Fluffy Cat? And <laughs> AI is going to make that so much more challenging because whereas today, if, you, if we look at what we give to the employee, we'll say, here's your quarterly security training. Don't click on a suspicious link. AI is going to make that link not look suspicious. Yeah. You will need tools like 1Password to sit there and help that human so that they can be productive, yeah. use the tools that but, they need to well, be secure. In layman's terms, though, how do you do that? How does your technology do that? Because I've seen these phishing, and they've gotten way better. I've got, you know, I used to be able to identify them a mile away, and now it's kind of like you're like, eh, it looks legit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think to a human, looks very close, mm -hmm. looks legit. But to a tool, to a technology, zeros and ones, they match or they don't identically. And so it's very easy for a tool to say, that's not a legitimate link, even though it looks very, very close. So the future of security, and your company's name is 1Password, is are we still going to be using passwords and two-step verification, or are we going to kind of move on to, to something a little bit more technologically savvy and, and more advanced than me refreshing my password for the fourth time in a month? Pass keys. Pass keys will be the answer. So, and how's that different from password? So a pass key is, at, at the end of the day, it's a public-private key pair, but it's a, it's a password chosen by a computer instead of a human. And what makes this so important is that it's the Apples, the Microsofts, the Googles, as well as companies like 1Password that have agreed to adopt pass keys. So it will be something that's convenient for a user, a human to use, but much more secure than the passwords of so today. So it's randomly generated or...? 
It's a, it's a, it's a key. So yes, it will be um, not only randomly generated, but from, a, from an encryption point of view, it's something that even if you gave yeah. away accidentally, mm -hmm. couldn't be used. Mm -hmm. how, about how easy is this? I, I went down, I mean, I just, I'll admit, I, I went down the key password with another, uh, with a, one of your competitors a while ago, and I used it for a few years, and it worked fine. But at some point, it got a little unwieldy, particularly when I'm not at home or I'm on the fly and I, I need to access something. I mean, how do you sort of address the usability of it? Because at the end of the day, one reason why we all use such simple passwords is because it's simple and it's easy to remember. I can remember Fluffy yeah. Cat. Yeah, I, yeah, me too. I'm going to remember. I'm going to use that tonight. You're going to remember yeah. Fluffy yeah. Cat. <laughs> exactly. I think usability is yeah. absolutely key. And from a, from a one password point of view, we actually mm -hmm. started our life as a consumer company. Mm -hmm. And when you're a con consumer company, there's nobody forcing you to use it, right? So you have to be usable. So we sit there and we say, in order for you to use it from a security point of view, we have to make it so that being good by being lazy is the way. If I can look at it and say, I'm going to use this, like day one, day two, you know it's keeping you secure. Yeah. But day three, you're like, man, I just want to tap this thing and get in. Yeah. Then you'll start to use it. That's a good point. Take us through what you think security will look like in five years' time. Is it going to be frictionless or is it going to be full of friction? Because sometimes that's the only way you know that it's working. Exactly. So today, as you say, like, you think of if it's difficult, it must be secure. And a big part of what we've been focusing on is how do we make the easy way the secure way? So from that perspective, whether it's pass keys or now when we look at things like extended access management, how do we allow you to use personal devices or the new SaaS you know, software that's come in from the edges? If we can secure every log into every app on every device, we can allow you to be productive, allow you to use the tools that you want to use and yet at the same time keep the businesses secure doing so. All right, good stuff. Jeff Shiner, CEO of One Password, and that's a regular capital P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D. There's no zeros or fours in there. You kind of <laughs> no. mess up the name. <laughs> Anyone who has to come up with a new password knows what I'm talking about. Coming up, we've got the top three where we focus in on some top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's big stories. This is The Close. Time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the people at the center of some of the day's top stories. And first up is Dave Calhoun, the Boeing CEO. Now, we spoke with the Boeing CEO earlier today about their safety plan. Any company, especially large-scale companies who are willing to be transparent about everything, they'll suffer less. We presented this comprehensive plan to our regulator. Here's one thing I want to make sure everybody understands. This is our plan, it's not our regulator's plan. If we slow it down and stick to the disciplines that will synchronize this supply chain with the insatiable demand for airplanes and stay disciplined on that, we will put all this in a rearview mirror. Kind of important to note, of course, that he's the outgoing CEO, yes. so he only has to do this for a little bit longer before it becomes someone else's responsibility. Absolutely, here. And they, uh, of course, Guy also asked him about the secession process, where they are along in that. They still got a ways to go. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, the CEO, at least for right now, is sticking around as Pat Gelsinger. He's the CEO over at Intel. He was on this stage at this big conference out there in Taiwan, and he really took aim at some of his chip competitors, including NVIDIA, saying that Jensen Wong's claim that Intel is sort of behind the times and that his traditional processors really can't pick up steam. He said, that's a fallacy here. He said, look, man, Moore's Law is still alive and well. Yeah, but I don't see him wearing a leather jacket and signing people's yeah. uh, shirts, T-shirts. You know? Yeah, well, we should point out, too, there was some breaking news just a little while ago on Intel. This involving a fab that they're building uh, over there uh, in Ireland and that Apollo is going to be taking a 49% mm. equity stake in the joint venture, basically about an $11 billion deal here. So he's trying to make some moves. I'm not sure a wafer factory in Ireland is sort of uh, the AI uh, narrative that investors want to hear, but maybe it provides some financial stability. Yeah, in the meantime, yeah. it's a bit of catch-up for Intel and all the other companies out yeah. there, really, to NVIDIA. All right, the last person we're watching is Brian Nickel. He is the CEO of Chipotle and addressing claims of smaller portions of Chipotle meals uh, on a video on TikTok. And of course, this is something that comes up all the time. People are always talking about shrinkflation and this idea that, you know, the burrito that you want is now getting smaller and smaller each time. Yeah, and he seems to be addressing this fact that when people are going into these stores, they're filming 
uh, the servers mm -hmm. who are putting their burritos and their bowls together to see if they're putting enough of the ingredients or whatever. He's basically saying, cut that out. You know, don't film our employees. But, you know, I, you know, who knows whether this is true. But if you look at the Internet, and I tend to believe everything on the Internet, Scarlet Foo, <laughs> is that everyone's saying that if you buy a burrito from Chipotle today, it's smaller than the one that maybe you would have gotten, I don't know, six months ago or a year ago. I think that would be fair to say. And it's not just Chipotle. To be fair to Chipotle, it's everyone, right? Yeah. I mean, when I go and get a pizza, it's a lot smaller than the pizza pan that but, it would. But he could clear all this up. You know how when you go to the airport and you want to bring your carry-on, they have that little thing you have to stick your yeah, bag yeah. in to make uh -huh. sure that it could fit through? They need that for the burritos. They have it right <laughs> on the counter. And if it fits in there and there's still space, you're like, dude, when unroll I that thing, throw some, throw some adobo on that thing, and let, yeah. let's go, yeah. They, or you weigh it, right? When I worked at 31 Flavors, I had to like weigh my scoop each time. You worked at Baskin Robbins? Yeah, a long time ago. Did you? Oh, yeah. okay. Got to hear about high uh, your, your high school job. There we here. go. Scarlett, you're like salt of the earth here. <laughs> All right, when we return, we're going to take a look back. Scarlett Fu, you're old enough to remember this, the advent of the VHS ah, videotape and its 30-year reign in U.S. living rooms. And here's a question before we go to break, Scarlett. What was the last Hollywood film to officially be released on Ooh. VHS? Titanic? All right, on this day back in 1977, executives from the Victor Company of Japan, better known as JVC, held a press conference ahead of that year's Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago to introduce to America the VHS videotape and player. Now, VHS had been floating around for a few years, but was only available in Asia, primarily Japan and South Korea. But JVC knew that expanding the technology meant getting U.S. households on board the video home system, as it was called, was officially introduced under the brand name Vidstar in the U.S. and was designed to compete with the Sony Betamax, a proprietary technology that entered the market a couple years prior. While Betamax had better picture quality, VHS offered more features, the tapes could hold twice the content, about two hours worth, and the players retailed for around half of the $2,000 price tag found on most Betamax models. But the real key to success for VHS was its open technology standard, which unlike Betamax, meant film studios and VCR makers could license the technology for free, allowing for wider adoptions. Now, a few months after the press conference, VHS tapes began to show up on U.S. store shelves. The first batch of movies, there were roughly 50 films that a company called Magnetic Video licensed from 20th Century Fox. It included MASH, Patton, and The Sound of Music, and it sparked one of the great consumer product wars of the modern era, a battle that saw Betamax's U.S. market share slip from virtually 100% in 1976 to 25% by 1981 and to barely 5% by 1988. And that was the year Sony finally acknowledged reality and started making VHS recorders itself alongside the Betamax. Eventually, both technologies would succumb to newer and more efficient formats, such as the LaserDisc, the DVD, and, of course, internet streaming. By 2003, DVD rentals had already overtaken videotape, and by 2006, movie studios decided to refocus completely on the newer format. And that brings us to our question of the day. What was the last Hollywood film officially released on VHS? The answer, David Cronenberg's action movie, A History of Violence, starring Viggo Mortensen as the owner of a small town diner whose criminal past comes back to haunt him. A lively romp. And if you're short on cash, maybe check to see, Scarlett, if you still have that videotape in the back of your closet. A used copy sold at auction last year for more than $2,000. Of that movie in particular, or any, because we have a lot. And I mean, that could be a potential gold mine. I have to tell my dad about that. But that was great. And by the way, we're part of the shrinking group of people who own Betamax because my parents bet on the wrong technology. But anyway, we move from VHS to streaming. It turns out the cost to watch your favorite HBO programs is going up. Warner Brothers Discovery is raising the price of the basic ad free subscription to its Max streaming service by $1 to $16.99 a month. Joining us for more is Geetha Ranganathan, Bloomberg Intelligence U.S. media analyst. Geetha, good to speak with you. I hope that you guys bet on VHS and not Betamax. Um, but when it comes to um, Warner Brothers Discovery's price hikes, it turns out it's only on the premium versions or the ad-free versions. The ad-supported versions, those prices do not change, do they? 
Yeah, they don't. And and this is really timed to perfection, Scarlett. So they do have a major release coming out in the next 10 days or so with House of the Dragon Season 2. That comes out on, on June 16th. And so they are obviously uh, timing, uh, timing it really well. Uh, you know, you have a lot more content also coming on Max later this year. Uh, but but you're absolutely right. The idea here is to really push those price sensitive, cost conscious c- consumers, uh, you know, who will resist this price change to that ad supported option, which only costs about ten dollars a month right now for the Max product. Is this? Uh, do we have to just get used to this, Geetha? I mean, I know everyone sort of said, okay, these prices were never going to hold. We were going to see increases here, but is this the start of something new? It absolutely is, Romain. So, you know, uh, Max, of course, just raised prices. We know Peacock is going to be raising its prices by about $2 just before the Olympics. Um, you know, we have Disney that is kind of cracking down on password sharing. Just yesterday, we know Spotify just uh, increased prices for its audio streaming product. So, yes, price increases are now kind of the name of the game. And we know why all of these companies are doing it. I mean, the subscriber growth story is over. They have to somehow show profits. And this is one way to do that. They have to show profits. So is this $1 increase to $16.99, for instance, going to show profits? Is it going to turn Warner Brothers Discovery into something that can generate profits consistently? Yeah, it is going to definitely uh, add to the top line and eventually to the bottom line as well. Now, uh, remember, Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, their, it, you know, their Max and their Discovery Plus streaming product. It is one of the first uh, streaming products out there, apart from Netflix, to actually be profitable. Last year, so they generated about, you know, again, it was just uh, just a modest profit. It was about 100 million, but they were profitable. You compare that to Paramount or uh, Paramount Plus or Peacock, you know, which lost literally billions of dollars on their streaming services. So Warner has kind of made this commitment to profitability. They've made this commitment to cost discipline and they're executing on it. They've committed or they've promised about a billion dollars in EBITDA for yeah. their streaming product in 2025. And this is, you know, this helps them get there. All right, uh, Geetha Raghunathan over there at Bloomberg Intelligence. The price increases that we're seeing over at Warner Brothers, as well as some of the other streaming giants out there. She didn't mention, though, was Paramount here. Do they have that pricing power? Uh, a manual meeting going on right now, ostensibly here, about the future of the company's ownership here. But we're also learning, based on Bloomberg reporting, that the company is now considering joint venture options for its streaming services. Of course, Paramount, the parent of CBS and MTV. Richard Greenfield joining us right now. He's a partner and media and technology analyst over at Lightshed Partners here. Uh, And Rich, let's start off here with the value proposition of Paramount. We've kind of got two big things happening right now. Of course, how uh, sort of these outside investors find a way to mollify Sherry Redstone and get a sale of this company, but really just about where Paramount lands in the streaming space right now, a very crowded streaming space. Well, look, I think a lot depends on who buys Paramount. I mean, I think if if Paramount is not acquired um, by Skydance, uh, where there's clearly has friction has developed over the course of the last few days, and it's not clear that a transaction actually gets over the goal line, I think if Paramount doesn't get a transaction done, Paramount it plus, uh, which you have up on the screen, is dead man walking. Like I don't think it survives the end of this calendar year. Mm. It gets joint ventured, scaled back. Like yeah. It will not look like it looks today. This thing is bleeding cash, mm. and Paramount needs to stem the bleeding and improve its profitability yesterday. So mm. I, I think the only way Paramount Plus survives in its current form uh-huh. is if Skydance buys Paramount. And I think their plan is actually to invest very aggressively. I think Skydance wants to build another Netflix-like competitor. They want to gun Paramount Plus with substantial capital that I'm not sure investors are fully aware of, but I do think that's the plan. I, I am curious, though. There was a lot of discussion as to why they even launched this. The idea that, uh, not, and this isn't just specific to Paramount, but with a lot of these streaming services, the idea that some of them were probably in a better financial position by just licensing their content to Netflix and you know uh, maybe Hulu Look, or Paramount something Plus else like was that. A, Paramount Plus was a, uh, a terrible decision it's why we wrote Bob Backish, the former CEO of Paramount, should have been fired. Um, he was fired. Uh, I think the honest answer is everybody who thought they could be Netflix, they can't. You know, technology, scale, it, this was a do, bad idea do, from the start. Do you think this is fixable? Um, it is not fixable without a massive investment in both, you know, because this is not just about adding more programming. Mm-hmm. This is about retooling it, really building on the, the the engineering side of this, bringing in best-in-class talent so that the interface UI 
is and, and the data and analytics and how it serves content. This is a lightly used service. Nobody who is watching Bloomberg right now is rushing to go stream Paramount Plus tonight. This is something where every once in a while there's a show you want to watch and you watch it for 40 minutes and then you go turn on Netflix or you go turn on YouTube. Like people are not d binging hours and hours a day of Paramount Plus content. And so in order to build that type of juggernaut is going to take massive investment in technology, programming and marketing. That's what I think mm -hmm. the plan would be under Skydance. What happened to the Apollo and Sony offer? Is that completely dead on arrival? Is, is there a way to resuscitate that or should that not be part of the conversation anymore? There's still, I mean, look, the, the, the special committee at Paramount would still like Sony to submit an offer. I think the problem is you've got, you know, foreign ownership issues to deal with, broadcast rights transfers that would, you know, be involved there. You, you, you've seen how sort of Tegna and Standard General got tr into trouble with all of that earlier this year with the F or last year with the FCC. Like if you're National Amusements and Redstone and you want cash, mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is get involved in a 12 or 18 month. Because remember, yeah. you don't even know who's going to be president. Right. So the whole administration of who's reviewing these deals could change in five months. So who knows how long it takes to approve a deal? Imagine you strike a deal you spend the next 15, 18 months, right. and then you get told no. Yeah, no, no, Where no. Where will Paramount be then? Like, I just think it's too risky. No no breakup fee can make up for waiting 15 to 18 months to only be told no. Especially if this is a business that, as you said, needs to improve profitability yesterday. Uh, they really can't afford to wait at all. So given exactly. all of that, what, I mean, what do Paramount shareholders want? Because none of these options are particularly great, um, but they bought into the stock knowing that Shari Redstone owns the, controls the voting shares. So what is their best case scenario here? It's, it's a great question, and I, I don't mean to be st stunned by it, but because it is the right question to ask. I mean, look, in the Skydance story, you're getting 40% of your um, in, in, of your current investment in cash at 15, but you don't get it for a year. And then the rest of your investment is diluted down. And I guess you hope that over multiple years, they can build a better company, certainly better than what the current team has done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the alternatives could be, you know, Redstone may just sell this to somebody else, sell her stake, mm -hmm. the national amusement stake to somebody else. And then you have no idea what the strategic plan is. Maybe it's to cut costs, close Paramount Plus, sell off a lot of the assets. Like, I think, you know, it's not clear. I, look, I think it's very hard to make an investment case in Paramount right now yeah. because you literally have no idea which way is up. Like, I, I'm surprised the stock is where it's at. Given the time to close and the risk factors that are being discussed, it's surprising the stock is held in where it is. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us currently. Well, you know, one day it's going to be turned into a streaming uh, series that, you know, we'll all be watching because the drama is, is just you can't make it up. Right. What, what would the title be? What would the <laughs> title be? We need a title. Let's do it right here. Tumbling from the top, maybe something like that. I don't know. We'll work on that. Richard, thank you so much. Rich Greenfield over at Lightshed Partners with the latest on Paramount. What would the t good title be on the Paramount drama? Um, just get it done. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, look, I mean, we all know that what the holdup is right now. I mean, this is really Sherry Redstone's decision yeah. and she's got to make one. I mean, maybe she doesn't. Uh, maybe she doesn't care. But I mean, at some point, uh, if investors are going to get what she they cares. want, she wants to she's going out. Well, she's going to give her money one way or the other. I guarantee you that. Yeah. She is, it, it just she is a redstone after all. <laughs> just depends on how long it takes and what's survived, uh, what's going to survive yeah. at the end of all that. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at how markets close at the end of this trading day. The S&P 500 closing up uh, two tenths of one percent. The 10 year yield moving down. So you had a bit of a rally in stocks, if you can call it that, a turnaround in the afternoon at least. And uh, the gains in bonds continues. The declines in oil deepen now down one and a half percent to seven. 7311 for WTI, a fresh four month low, and Bitcoin continues to gain. This is the close. past Republican obstruction and using the executive authorities available to me as president.
to do what I can on my own to address the border. Frankly, I would have preferred to address this issue through bipartisan legislation because that's the only way to actually get the kind of system we have now that's broken, fixed, to hire more Border Patrol agents, more asylum officers, more judges. But Republicans have left me no choice. That was President Biden speaking earlier after unveiling a series of measures to curb asylum claims and head off a surge of border crossings this summer. Joining us now is Joe Matthew, co-host of Bloomberg's Balance of Power. And of course, this comes before the November election. Can you walk us through very quickly what the new measures entail and how long they'll be in place? Yeah, well, there are a couple of steps here, and they're going to sound pretty familiar because as the president just referred, uh, these concepts, these ideas that he's now moving through executive action were born from that whole debate that led us to the border compromise in the Senate that went nowhere. Remember, it was DOA in the House, never even got a vote in the Senate, and here we are today. Uh, this essentially would give the president the authority to shut down the border when illegal crossings top 2,500 in a day. It also tightens the definition of asylum and would prevent those who cross illegally from receiving asylum. Uh, this is something that's been very controversial in the past, and it's, it's frankly making the both sides of the aisle upset here. Uh, we already know that Republicans were upset with Joe Biden when it came to the border. Brian Stile, Republican from Wisconsin, was on with us earlier today. He described it as woefully insufficient. But Pramila Jayapal, who is the leader of the Progressive Democratic Caucus in the House, called it very disappointing. So the president has once again found an issue that upsets both sides of the political spectrum. Yeah, uh, quite a feat here uh, for a politician, Joe, that's uh, running for re-election. I am curious here as to, uh, he tried to sort of make this connection to, I guess, the failed effort uh, in Congress uh, earlier this year, I believe, uh, to actually pass that bipartisan legislation here. Does the executive order that he put out today, does it have any real elements from what was originally in that le legislation? In terms of that authority to shut down the border and the cap on the number of illegal crossings per day, that is what sounds familiar. But the president says it himself in a statement. This came before his address today. To be clear, he writes, this cannot achieve the same results as congressional action. It does not provide the critical personnel or funding needed to further secure our border. Congress still must act. You're hearing people refer to this as a Band-Aid, and you can figure but, out why. But this gets to the point, too, Joe, right? I mean, this is kind of a campaign issue, right? And he basically can now at least go out on the campaign trail and say, I did mm -hmm. something. Now, people may hate it, but he can at least say that, yeah. even if it's not really true. Well, that's right, Romaine, and it's, it's not lost on us. That that's why Tom Swasey was standing there, the Democratic congressman from New York, newly uh, re-elected on the issue of the border. The way he handled that was seen as a bit of a roadmap. Kathy Hochul, the governor, was in the East Room today as well. As Democrats try to make the point that they're doing what they can here, and as the president says, Donald Trump and the Republican uh, conference on Capitol Hill kept them from doing it. Whether this makes a difference in the numbers, it probably will lower border crossings, and they have been coming down a bit over the past couple of months. But, you know, speaking of politics and elections, Romaine, the timing here is not a mistake for the election here, but it also comes a day after uh, we saw results in mm. the elections in Mexico, and yeah. the White House was waiting for that to transpire, too. No, that's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, of course, there's going to be challenges to uh, these executive orders. Uh, do we expect anything yes. from the president's team, his own team, the Democratic Party? Um, in terms of challenges legally, that, that's what I would expect. And we've seen this movie before. This is the same uh, uh, element that Donald Trump used, Section 212F, uh, that brings us to the immigration code here in the United States. That's the authority that the president is pointing to. It didn't work for Donald Trump a couple of times in court, and it may not for this president either. Getting back to what Romaine said, this is Joe Biden's chance to say, at least I tried. All right, Joe Matthew, you can catch him in full along with his co-host Kelly Lines on Balance of Power that comes up at the top of the hour every day right here at Bloomberg. Meanwhile, we still got a lot more to cover here on The Close, setting you up for some of the big market moving events over the next 24 hours. It's our What to Watch segment, and it's up next. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's set you up for what to watch. Investors keep an eye on earnings out of Lululemon before the bell tomorrow. Poonam Goyal, Bloomberg Intelligence senior U.S. retail analyst, joining us right now to talk about what is, at least for right now, 
one of the worst performing stocks this year in the S&P 500. Are the earnings tomorrow going to turn around sentiment at all, Poonam? I think, you know, the focus is on the slowing growth, right? So after the fourth quarter, when they were able to post double digit gains after very strong increase of the year prior, we thought that that momentum would continue into the first quarter, but it hasn't. It's slowing. Growth is expected to be in the high single digits, maybe at best 10%, and that's a material deceleration for what we saw in 2023. So what could turn the sentiment around is if 1Q, they report it's better than expected, of course, which we think it'll be in line, or if the 2Q guidance is better. So we do think that Lululemon has added innovation into their stores with spring colors. Mm -hmm. And if that has the ability to drive up demand and they issue more positive guidance, that could possibly get investors more excited. I go into Lululemon all the time and I'm ready to spend money, but I don't actually ever spend any money because it's all versions of the same thing that they always sell. One thing I've noticed though, is they have sneakers. They have sneakers on display and this is kind of a new area for them. Is that a growth driver for Lululemon? It's a growth driver, but it's not as big as a growth driver as men's and digital is. So if you think about the growth story from Lululemon from this point onward, it's really about scaling the men's business as well as the digital business. We do think that shoes is an incremental opportunity, but we think it'll take some years, if that, for Lululemon to really master the trade because it's not an area where they have core competency in. Yeah, I'm looking at, I'm on the website right now, Poon. I'm looking at these shoes and woof. Uh, I mean, I, I guess they might appeal to somebody. Poonam Goyal over at Bloomberg Intelligence, a nice preview of Lululemon, third worst performer in the S&P 500. Expectations high heading into that earnings report tomorrow. A lot of other things out there, Scarlett, that could potentially move the market, including a central bank decision. Yeah, well, let's focus on the one in North America because there's one in Poland, too. The Bank oh. of Canada is ready to pivot. Um, the question is when. Does it do it tomorrow or does it wait until late July? And one thing is that it Perhaps it was a little bit late to the party when it decided to raise rates. So um, yeah. it, it depends on how cautious or how much of, how bold they're willing to be right One now. One of the more important things that I'm keeping an eye on tomorrow comes at about 10 a.m. Yep. here in New York time. And that's the ISM services data here in the U.S. Now, we had that manufacturing data earlier this week. Mm -hmm. We kind of knew that was going to be soft. I don't know what their expectations are right now for services. Yeah, and especially within the prices paid component will be critical because we know that the cost for services has been fairly sticky and that's something the Fed is looking at very carefully. Right now, um, it is projected to ease a bit to 59, still above that 50 expansion line from 59.2. But this will be really critical. And one of the last data points before the Fed meets uh, next week. You know, we're sending another rocket ship up into space. This time it's the Boeing Starliner here. This is, a, I believe, it's going to be a crewed test mission here. Uh, remember, this had been delayed for some weather and some other issues, but now set to take off. 10.52 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. Yeah, the first mission carrying astronauts to the International Space Station since NASA awarded contracts uh, in 2014 to Boeing and SpaceX to do the job. But we know there have been a lot of delays, a lot of missteps, and uh, cross your yeah. fingers it's going to happen. And we get more earnings. They continue to roll in. Of course, we talked about those Lululemon earnings coming before the bell. But we get Dollar Tree Campbell Soup as well. Campbell Soup. When was the last time you actually opened a can of soup? Uh, yeah, I never. I, Elementary school, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I can't remember <laughs> there. Five Below and Victoria's Secret. Talk about a comeback story that hasn't happened. Yeah. Uh, of course, we will have full coverage of all those earnings right here on Bloomberg. Join us tomorrow on the close and stick around. All your politics coverage coming up right now on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg.